Howdy. My name is Jason Robert Bailey. I'm a faculty member with the Department of Mathematics and Statistics here at Texas Tech and University. And if you are taking Math 2345 during the spring semester, then I am your professor for the course for the semester. And if it's during the fall semester, I am very probably your professor. These lecture videos are primarily intended for students in my courses, but if you are a student in another section, you're always welcome to use these as review and for learning purposes. If you are one of the in-person students, then you'll find that these lectures are nearly identical to the ones that we go over in person. And if you're one of the online students, then these, of course, are your lecture videos. Some of these lectures and lecture videos are straight from the in-person sections. Some of them are re-recorded ones to ensure that the materials that are gone over are with the curriculum as it is updated over the years. So, for example, this lecture video is technically a recorded one and not a live lecture. But if you wanted to see the live lecture for this one, it is with the older lecture videos playlist that is provided on this departmental YouTube channel along with Blackboard. Please choose whichever is best for you. Some students will use these lecture videos as their primary methods of understanding the material. Others will use them as review. No matter which student you are, all of these lecture videos will be timestamped. On the YouTube play bar, you should be able to highlight over it to see what section you're on and perhaps what section you're looking for. So if you don't need to review an entire lecture and just need a specific part, you can go look for that timestamp for easy access. If for some reason that bar with the chapters does not show up when you hover over it, if you click show more in the description of this lecture video, it will have the clickable timestamps for the parts that you need. So those should make it easier to navigate through the lecture videos. All of these whiteboards are available both blank and filled out on Blackboard, if you're enrolled in my courses, that is. On Blackboard, there's a zip file called blank whiteboards or blank boards. You can download that and extract the zip file to choose the blank board if you want to use it to work along with the lectures, if you like using those for notes. Some students will do classic old school notebook style. Others will have tablets, maybe iPads or laptops or what have you, and download the blank boards so they can work along with them in class or with the lecture. Alternatively, if you want the full whiteboard filled out, those are posted to Blackboard as well. In this case, you'll notice I technically use paint as the whiteboard here. And the reason why is to try to minimize the amount of handwriting that may be difficult to read and try to use typed out things as much as possible. The issue with using, say, PowerPoint slides as the main method of presentation is it's not as easy to interactively write on those for the benefits of helping the students. If you do like PowerPoint slides, those are provided in this course as well as supplementary materials. So let's get to the formatting of these lectures and how they work. If you are not interested in any of these introductions, again, it's timestamped in the uh, lecture video description and with the automatic chapters as well. So you can skip right over this part if you want to go straight to the materials. The way these lectures will be formatted is I will have these whiteboards and they will be prepared and only filled out to the extent they're needed to describe the lecture. I will introduce a motivating example in most cases because Financial statistics is meant to be a very applied course, and us professors have a responsibility to teach you the material in a way that you can apply it. Oftentimes, you might see on social media jokes about algebra being useless, and you can't blame those people because their teachers didn't show them what they could do with algebra, or their teachers didn't show them what they could do with other mathematics courses that they were teaching. And... A professor can do the best job in the world of teaching the material, but if that professor doesn't show you what you can do with what you're learning, then it's only so useful. And so you're going to see as we go through this course that I'm going to try to use a lot of applied examples so that you can clearly see how you can use this 
not just in this course or for the rest of your major, but in your life as well. And so my hope is that when you come out of this course, you'll not only have an excellent understanding of the material, but actually find yourself being able to use it in your life so you can think to yourself, well, this course was actually a valuable learning experience. And so to that end, we'll usually start off with a motivating example. Sometimes the motivating example will be the first practice example. It just depends on the lecture video. You'll be able to clearly see that as we move along. A majority of students who take this course are majoring with the College of Business. The Rawls College of Business, that is, COBA, as you might call it. And so therefore, I guess College of Business Administration, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Most students are majoring in business, finance, or what have you, so a majority of these applied examples will be dealing with business, but I will ensure that for those of you that are not majoring in a business or finance related field, that we have examples that work for you as well, and of course, there'll be examples that help everyone out. So, some examples will just be straight up numerical examples to get you introduced to the material. Now, after we go through the motivating example, if there is one, if it's not baked in with the practice examples themselves, we'll go over some important definitions that you might need for the lecture. Some students like to write these down, others will take a picture, others just take it in and absorb it as it is being explained to them. If there are any diagrams or whatnot that are useful for understanding the materials, we'll go through those because many students are visual learners and do like having those diagrams to help them out. And then we'll usually go into some practice examples and rinse and repeat as we go through the lectures. So hopefully there's going to be something for all of you in these lectures and lecture videos as we go through them. The filled out lecture whiteboards, as stated earlier, are provided on Blackboard should you find those to be of use. You will find that we will work out some web work problems here and there in the whiteboards because students will oftentimes find those to be helpful. So with that out of the way, for those of you that stayed through and listened through that seven-minute introduction, hopefully I haven't bored you too much, and for those of you that have skipped forward to around this time, let us begin. So in this case, we're going to start with a motivating example of a selection of countries in the world and some financial information about them. So, for example, in the case of the first one up here, Armenia, this is a country in Central Asia, just south of Russia. This is some World Trade Organization data about them. A member nation of the World Trade Organization has access to its benefits with regards to rules for world trade. You can be a member or an observer. We have per capita GDP, which is supposed to be a rough measure of how productive its citizens are. We have trade deficit, which tells you whether or not you know, they're importing more than they export on a dollar basis. And then you have Fitch rating, which is meant to describe how creditworthy they are. And then Fitch Outlook represents how they're looking heading into the future. So is their government having problems with maintaining budgets? Are they borrowing large amounts of money? Are they paying off large amounts of money? And those inform your Fitch Outlook. So with all these data values, the first thing you need to do is actually collect them and then you need to talk about them and present them in a manner that somebody who is completely unfamiliar with math and stats can understand. As we all know, if you get into the corporate or business world, there's probably going to be at least one manager that doesn't really have any idea what's going on at all whatsoever, and you're going to have to help them out as the mathematically and statistically inclined person. So let's help you out with that and start with some basic definitions. At any point, if you need some time to write these down, you can just simply pause the lecture video and continue with them. For the in-person lectures and the recorded in-person lectures, of which we have some of, particularly some of the older ones, you'll see me you know, say, does anyone have any time to write this down? In the case of here, if you need any time to write this down, you can just pause and unpause when you are ready to go. So, many of these definitions you are very likely familiar with. And as we go through chapter one, you might ask yourself, why in the Lord's name are we going over things this simple? The reason why is because I believe that we should start with a foundation that anybody, no matter their high school experience, can work with. We could certainly start straight with chapter three, 
And some students in the class would have the foundations necessary for it, but other students would immediately fall to the wayside. And so it's important that we get all these foundations down so that way everyone can start from a good position. So if you find everything in chapter one to be a cakewalk, then congratulations, you'll be in good position heading into the unit one test. But for other students who don't have as good of a foundation, we can ensure that everyone is good to go. So data, data sets, I'm going to assume that anyone can do some basic reading. So I'm particularly going to start with some of these next ones, especially populations and samples, because these are the first key distinctions that you'll need to make in this course. A population is everything you could have. So let's suppose I was doing a survey of all of the students in the course, not just the people who were at a lecture or just the people responding to an email, but absolutely every single student enrolled. That would be the entire population for students in that section. On the other hand, suppose that I only sampled the people who were at the lecture for that given day. That would very likely not be the entire class making it a sample of the population. This distinction is going to be extraordinarily important for the entire remainder of the course. It'll impact which formulas you'll use. It'll even impact in hypothesis tests which distributions you use. When we construct confidence later intervals later in the course, it will decide how you set up the margin of error for that interval. And so with all that in mind, it's very important that no matter your background in math and stats, you make sure you have that distinction underway. Now, when we're getting these data values, in the examples of the World Trade Organization statuses and attributes, we did what's called an observational study. The data is already out there, we just collect it. And as is implied by the word experiment, you are actively affecting and controlling certain conditions so that we can just see how one particular input or variable is affecting our outcome. You most see this in the STEM fields and fields like psychology or animal science. Whereas when you're dealing with finance, and business, you tend to lean more so towards observational studies. Now, when we're doing these observational studies or experiments, and when we're drawing from our population or sample, we need to consider the type of data that we have, because the type of data you have informs what graphical displays you might use and what analyses you might do of those data values. So the first distinction is between cross-sectional and time series data values. Cross-sectional data values are all collected at the same point in time. So for example, if I asked everybody in class, do you have at least 15 credit hours? That's gonna be all at one point in time. On the other hand, if I did it every single day, and for some reason expected the answer to change, then that makes it time series. As is implied by the word time in time series, these are collected at different points in time. So as a very good example of time series data, you might look at the value of your stock portfolio. So if after getting your degree from the Rawls School of Business and you go off to work at Wall Street and you're working on quantitative finance and constructing a portfolio, it could be for a hedge fund or a private client, then you're going to be evaluating the performance of that portfolio over every single trading day. And that is going to make it time series. Now, additionally, these data values can be quantitative or qualitative. Another word for qualitative is categorical. They both mean the same thing. We can use them interchangeably, and we will use them interchangeably. You'll find that's a pretty common occurrence in this course where you can say one thing in multiple different ways with multiple different words, and they all mean the same thing and can be used interchangeably. Now, as is implied by the word categorical or qualitative, qualitative uh, data inputs are not numbers or they're what are called non-quantitative numbers. And this is the first part that will trip some students up. So you might think, well, hold on, quantity, quantitative, that's a number. What in the Lord's name is a non-numbered number? A classic example of that and pretty much the idea of what a non-numbered number is, is when we use a number as a stand-in for a word. So here's an example. 
At the end of each semester for each course you take, if you decide to, you can fill out final course evaluations. And those usually use what's called the Likert scale. For those of you in the animal sciences, you are very familiar with Likert scales. When you rate something on a scale of 1 to 5, when you give somebody a 5, what you don't mean is 5 the number, but 5 as a stand-in for excellent or awesome or amazing. If, on the other hand, you go to a restaurant and the food is horrendous and you go to Google and give it a one star, what that one really means is you think it was horrible. It was a disaster. It was terrible. So those numbers, one to five, are more so stand-ins for words and phrases as opposed to numbers themselves. We could certainly try to average them together, but you're really taking words, converting them into numbers, then average them together. This is why all of us could easily conclude if you're looking at two restaurants and one of them has a rating of a 4.9 stars out of 5 stars, the other one has 4.8 stars out of 5 stars, any reasonable person will conclude, ah, 4.8, 4.9, same thing. Technically, one is higher than the other, but because you're trying to quantify subjective feelings and thoughts, you could expect that very small difference to just be due to nothing crazy. And so in that case, those one through five are just stand-ins for words and phrases. Here's another example. Suppose, if you're familiar with computer science, we're talking about Booleans. Booleans are true and false. In computer science, and this is frankly how a lot of computers ran, same with the chips in your phone, we use zeros and ones. Binary, that's what binary means, zero or one. Technically two choice, but in the case of computer science, binaries are zeros and ones. In those cases, though, the zeros and ones are stand-ins for false and true. So technically zero is a number, but in that case, it's a stand-in for false. Technically one was a number there, but it was really a stand-in for true. So when we say non-quantitative numbers, we're essentially referring to numbers that are just stand-ins for words. On the other hand, let's suppose that we're talking about your grade in this course, and it's from 0 to 100%. I suppose you could say 1 to 100%, same idea. In that case, we could all agree if someone has 100, they performed outstandingly, and if someone has a 25, they were a complete and total disaster, but we can still quantitatively, through their percentage, determine how well they did. So, in the case of quantitative versus qualitative, qualitative, it's not a number, it'll be qualitative. And if it's quantitative, it very probably will be a number. But make sure you pay particular attention to that edge case of a non-quantitative number. So, with those in mind, we have what are called scales of measurement. All data values can be put into one of these four scales of measurement. Nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. You can, broadly speaking, put these into two pairings, nominal and ordinal, and interval and ratio. Nominal and ordinal scales deal with qualitative data values, whereas interval and ratio scales deal with quantitative data values. So if you can correctly identify what type of data you're dealing with, you're already, at worst, down to a 50-50. So let's start with nominal and ordinal, the easier of the two. Nominal data values deal with labels, names, qualitative values, where the order does not matter. On the other hand, when dealing with ordinal scales of measurement, as is implied by the name ordinal, the order does matter. So as an example of this, let's suppose we were talking about letter grades. Unless you're the type of person that's trying to speed run dropping out of college, you want to be getting better letter grades in your courses. And so an A is better than a B, which is better than a C, which is better than a D, which is usually, sometimes, better than an F. And so in that case, we would say the letter grades constitute an ordinal scale of measurement. On the other hand, with nominal, you could talk about a person's biological sex. If someone is a biological male versus a biological female, there are some places where that's going to result in a different circumstance and some places where it won't. It is not necessarily always better to be a male over a female or a female over a male. And so we could say that your biological sex is nominal. Nothing too crazy between those two. All you just have to ask yourself is, does the order matter? Interval and ratio are a little bit different. 
And as a very important note, ratio is not the type of ratio that you might see on Twitter or Instagram where you are L plus ratioing someone. This is a different kind of ratio. It's the mathematical ratio. I know some of you might be a little bit disappointed that it's not the social media type of ratio, but rest assured, this is math. It's got to get boring at some point. So the primary difference between interval and ratio is, as is implied by the word ratio, whether or not if we took two numbers, if the ratio meant something. You might say, well, how do we know if the ratio means something? Here we have something called the twice rule. The twice rule is we choose two values such that one of them is exactly twice as much as the other. Then we ask ourselves if the statement is x is twice as much as y makes sense in the context of the problem. So here's an example of each. Let's suppose we're looking at home values, and we have one home that's valued at $400,000 and another home that's appraised at $200,000. If you wanted to buy the former home, the $400,000 home, you're going to have to pay twice as much money, which is probably going to take you twice as much time to earn. And so that ratio means something. It costs twice as much. On the other hand, let's suppose we have one person who finishes the course with a 95%. The other person has a 47.5%. Is it reasonable to say that the first person is twice as smart as the second person? No. If anything, they're much smarter than twice as smart because you do kind of have to try pretty hard to get a 47.5%. And so in that case, the ratio doesn't make any sense. It doesn't mean anything. And so in the case of interval versus ratio, ask yourself if the ratios mean something. And obviously these deal with numerical data values, the quantitative ones. What this means, and for those of you who are visual students, you're gonna particularly like this, we can create a tree diagram for figuring out what scale of measurement something is. I strongly recommend that you have this in preparation for the web works and the tests. So when you're trying to identify the scale of measurement, First, ask yourself if your data value is quantitative or qualitative. If you can answer just this question correctly, worst case scenario, it's a 50-50. On web work, for all multiple choice questions, you will have two attempts. Meaning, if you can correctly identify the type of data value, then you'd be guaranteed to get the full point since you'd have two tries. Now, of course, if you answer the first question incorrectly, then you'd be guaranteed to get it wrong. But I think we could all agree the first question is much easier to answer than what type of scale of measurement is it. So let's suppose you identify the data value as being a quantitative data value. Then ask yourself if that twice rule applies. Does it make sense? Does it make sense to say x is twice as much as y? Does that make sense in the context of the problem? If it does, then it is a ratio data value. And for those of you that like the social media, I have been nice and put the L in there. Some of you are going to take some L's on tests. Most of you won't. Some of you will. It's a fact of life. Welcome to the real world. On the other hand, if the twice rule does not apply, if it doesn't make any sense to use it, then it's going to be an interval data value. On the other hand, let's suppose that it is a qualitative data value. So you identify it as being qualitative. Ask yourself if the order matters. Does the order mean anything? Does it make sense to order these? If so, then it will be ordinal. If not, then it will be nominal. This is the primary and ideal way to identify the type of scale of measurement that a particular data value might be. On the test itself, when it comes to these, here's types of questions you might be asked. So first, I will give you a type of data and I'll ask you to characterize it not in terms of scale of measurement but cross-sectional versus time series and quantitative versus qualitative so what that means is your answer choices might be answer choice a cross-sectional and quantitative your second answer choice might be cross-sectional and qualitative your third answer choice might be time series and quantitative. And your fourth answer choice might be time series and qualitative. Now, of course, it could be randomized, but it's the same idea. So you need to identify which pairing is correct. So for example, let us suppose that we were talking about letter grades at the end of the semester. Letter grades, in that case, these are qualitative. 
So already, if we're dealing with the case of letter grades, so I'll put letter grades here. So letter grades at the end of the semester. In this case, because the letter grades are going to be qualitative, because they are categories, as exemplified by categories of letter grades, what this means is quantitative is out. So A is out and C is out. Because they're all at the end of the semester, at one point in time, they're not time series, meaning we'd be left with B. So that'd be your full credit. But what happens if you chose a wrong answer? In this course, I think it's a bit ridiculous, really in life in general, to give a big old multiple choice test, pick two answer choices that are both extremely similar, and then two answer choices off the middle of nowhere, but then argue that the answer choice that was correct up until the last step is everybody's wrong as the others. For those of you that have ever taken an advanced placement test in high school for an English class, or any multiple choice test for a humanities course, you probably know full well when you take those multiple choice tests, you have two answers off in the middle of nowhere, and one answer choice that is nearly identical to that last one. I think it's a bit ridiculous to have that one be worth no credit, and I also think it's a bit lazy on the part of the professor to give a multiple choice test but then not give any partial credits. In this course, at least if you have myself, Professor Bailey, as your uh, professor for the course, there will be partial credits for most multiple choice questions. So you might ask yourself, fine, explain it to me. I need you to give me an exclamation, an exclamation, explanation of how these partial credits work. So let's consider it for the example that we just have here. Here is how the partial credits might work. So we had the correct answer of cross-sectional and qualitative. So let's suppose instead you chose cross-sectional and quantitative. In this case, you got the cross-sectional part correct, but you got the quantitative part wrong. In this case, you'd get half credit because you got one of the two parts of it correct. Let's suppose you chose answer choice D. You got the qualitative part correct, but you got the time series part wrong, so that one would be half credit. On the other hand, if you pick time series and quantitative, sorry, you screwed the whole thing up. There's nothing we can do there. That's an example of how partial credits will work in this course. In the case of scales of measurement, if the answer choice is ratio, but you put nominal, it, that's just completely and totally wrong. There's no partial credit we can award. On the other hand, if you chose interval, well, it's still not correct, but it's better than putting nominal. And so that one, you might say, get half credit for. So there will be partial credits in this course for most multiple choice questions. There are some multiple choice questions where all the other answers are just horribly, horribly wrong. But for the most part, multiple choice questions will have partial credits in this course. So I hope that most of you are fans of that. So now with that covered, let's go back to the motivating example and talk about it in the context of these definitions. So now that we come back over here, Let's categorize these five attributes into whether they are categorical or quantitative. I'm going to use C for categorical and Q for quantitative. This is another why, reason why sometimes you'll use categorical instead of qualitative because you'd have two Qs. So in the case of World Trade Organization status, you can be a member or an observer in this case. So that'll be a category. GDP per capita, this is clearly a number. And it's not a non-numbered number, if you will. So this will be quantitative. Same for trade deficit. That'll also be quantitative. Again, these are all numbers. In the case of Fitch rating, these are categories. So we're going to say C for categorical. Fitch outlook, you can be positive, negative, or stable. These are all categories, so categorical. So now let's leave the World Trade Organization status aside for a moment. And let's focus on these four. These are all at one point in time. Everything here is cross-sectional. I'll put this off to the side. So here's the question, though. What data types are these for scales of measurement? In the case of Fitch rating and Fitch outlook, you would rather your country be heading in a positive direction than a negative direction. Because if it's in a positive direction, you probably have a stable budget. Maybe it's even a surplus. And you definitely aren't blowing out the debt. On the other hand, 
if you have a very screwed up budget with a very large deficit, you might have a negative outlook, and that's something you should try to avoid. And so in this case, we're going to say that these two are ordinal. You'd rather have a triple A rating than a triple F rating, I suppose. And of course, the plus sign is better than the minus sign. And you'd rather be positive than negative in terms of your outlook. Let's now look at your per capita GDP and your trade deficit. In the case of these two, these are quantitative data values. This means they're going to be interval or ratio. The question is, which one? Let's use the twice rule. So let's consider first the case of per capita GDP. And let's consider the examples of Cape Verde and China, as some people might say. At the time this data was collected, China had a per capita GDP roughly twice as much as that of Cape Verde. If you don't know where Cape Verde is, off the west coast of the African continent. So does it make sense to say China citizens are twice as productive on a per capita basis as Cape Verde citizens? The answer is yes. And so therefore, our first one will be ordinal. What about trade deficit? Well, in the example of trade deficit, let's look here for two countries that are roughly uh, twice as much. Here we go. We have Australia right here and Azerbaijan. Australia's uh, total trade deficit or surplus is roughly twice as much as Azerbaijan's. So does it make sense to say twice as many dollars are going in or out? The answer is yes. The deficit or surplus is twice as large. It means twice as much money going in or out. And so in both of these cases, we're going to say that they are ordinal. No, that was not ordinal. <laughs> no, ratio. Sorry about that. Ordinal is the previous one. They are both going to be ratio because it makes sense to say China citizens are twice as productive as Cape Verde's and that Australia has twice as large of a deficit or surplus. So with those completed, let's move on to a large number of practice examples for you to work with. If this was quite literally being done live in person, which if you're an in-person student, this will be. If you're an online student, technically you can just pause and wait, or you can go to a previous in-person lecture video, which are the older ones. I have a large number of examples here for you to work with. If you're an in-person student, we probably wait around five or so minutes to do this one. Technically speaking here though, you can just simply pause the video and work on these yourself and then proceed on to the answers. And notice we have six graphs and two questions for each. So effectively, it's like 12 practice questions. And this will be how it's like on the test. You'll be given some display or some data value and be asked to identify the data type and perhaps the scale of measurement. So you should find this to be great practice, not just for the web work, but especially the test itself. So take a moment to work on this. And when you're ready to go, then you can hit that play button if it isn't already playing so that we can continue on to the answers. So, in this case, let's start with the first one, the classification of statistics students. For all of these, we're going to first start off with the first question, so identify the data type, and then we'll go to the scale of measurement, because if you misidentify the data type, then you're going to be in trouble on the scale of measurement. So, I will stop for just a moment after going over the answers for the first question, so that if you want to rework it, you can. In the case of the classification of, of the statistics students, it could be, say, for this course. It could be for other ones. In this case, since we did it all at one point in time, that's going to make it cross-sectional. So I'm just going to say cross for cross-sectional. Additionally, you can fall into one of these categories. You could be a freshman, you could be a sophomore, you could be a junior, you could be a senior, but it doesn't make sense to be 1.4 freshmen. That makes no sense whatsoever. Presumably, these are collections of credit hours, but you don't necessarily know where in there they fall with their credit values, which means this is going to be cross-sectional and categorical. We'll come back to the scale of measurement for this one in a moment. Let's go to number two. 
If you're having a difficult time seeing this, I'll go ahead and zoom in for you. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average for the period covering September of 2005 through September of 2015. And you can see the value of that Dow Jones Industrial Average there. At this juncture, these values are a weighted, technically a weighted average, if you will, through some formulas, which you might learn about in a different course with the College of Business. It's the weight average of the components of the Dow Jones. They change over time. They'll move some out, bring some in. So, of course, that's technically going to be an upward trend over time. But regardless of the context of the Dow Jones, these values of the Dow Jones are quite clearly quantitative numbers. And if we look right here, obviously the Dow Jones at its tro after the Great Recession was nowhere near as good as it was, say, halfway through the 2010s decade. Regardless, these are quite clearly quantitative numbers, meaning that this is going to be quantitative. Additionally, these values are over time. Technically speaking on this graph, we have them for each day over these uh, months, weeks, years, all the way through the whole decade, meaning that these will be time series. So I'm just going to put time for time series. So that is our second one. Coming back on over to our third one, we now have the number of credit hours completed per student. In this case, this is once again like with the classification for number one, all at one point in time, meaning it is going to be cross-sectional. However, credit hours aren't just stand-ins for words. If you have one student who has 30 credit hours versus someone who has no credit hours, that first student has essentially completed two full semesters of work. Sometimes a student will do like 36 hours in one year because those students really want to get through. They want to get their degree done so they can get in the employment sector. Absolutely fine with that. Nothing wrong with that. Go at whatever pace is best for you. But regardless, this time around, because we're now looking at the credit hours completed instead of the classification of those students, that is going to flip it into being quantitative. Coming back over here for number four, we're now looking at the net income for McDonald's over 2007 to 2015. And these are in billions of dollars. Now, I know we all would like it if these billions of dollars could go straight into our pockets, because if so, I wouldn't be teaching and y'all wouldn't be at college. We'd all be retired in the Bahamas, but we're not McDonald's. We're moving through life as best we can. Regardless, in this case, as a fun little bit of context, you can see that big jump from the Great Recession, and that's partly because since people did not have as much money to work with during the Great Recession, they couldn't afford to go out to expensive restaurants as much. McDonald's is, generally speaking, not as expensive, which is why... McDonald's oftentimes does well during recessions. Regardless, this is going to be over a, quite literally, series of time. So just like with our first one, it'll be time series. And these net incomes are quite literally quantitative values. So just like with that second example, it will be quantitative and time series. Coming down to number five. Some students will be working part-time to help pay their tuition costs. Other students go full-time work and will try to take as many courses as they can while they're at it. Many of those students will take, say, nine hours per semester and then work full-time so that they can effectively use the work to pay for college and hope for a better job afterwards. Other students, you might be one of them, will work part-time per week to help pay for college expenses so you'll get too large of debt. Either way, in this case, it is once again all at one point in time, making it cross-sectional, and you can fall into one of these two categories. So it'll be cross-sectional and categorical. Finally, we have the occupancy rate of South Florida hotels during the coronavirus pandemic. As you can see, right before the pandemic went into full swing, those hotels in South Florida were nearly at full occupancy, but as the pandemic in the year 2020 really began to roll on, those occupancy numbers dropped through the floor to barely even 
In these cases, since we're looking over a series of months for that year, that's going to make it time series. And since these percentages are telling us what quite literally percent of these rooms are being occupied, that'll make it quantitative and time series. So, now that we've covered that, if you made a mistake on any of those identifications, then you can go back and rework this second question. So if you want to do that, you can go ahead and pause, but if you have all these correct, then of course we can keep going into the second question involving scales of measurement. And for those that are particularly astute, you will notice that all the ones on the left were cross-sectional and all the ones on the right were time series. And the ones on the right were also all quantitative. Most of the time you're going to see quantitative data values. So let's get into those scales of measurement. In the case of the first one, because it is categorical, this means that our scale of measurement is either going to be nominal or ordinal. And so in that case, the question is, does the order matter? Now, as much as we might like to think, because we were all freshmen at some point, that freshmen are every bit as up to speed as the seniors, there's a reason why the seniors have more credit hours. They've been there longer, and by literal definition, if you have more credit hours, you should be closer to getting your degree done. All said and told, you'd rather be a senior than a freshman. Not trying to insult you or anything, although if you are a freshman, there are still many more things to learn. Regardless, because the order of these categories does matter, that's going to make it ordinal. Next up, coming over here to the Dow Jones Industrial Average again, it's either going to be interval or ratio. So the question is, does the twice rule apply? Let's pick two points where one was twice the other. So this is the peak right before the Great Recession, and this is the tro right during slight, slash slightly afterwards. In this case, if you had your stock portfolio of the Dow Jones in September of 2007, it had been valued roughly twice as much as the tro during the Great Recession. You'd rather have twice as much money then as you would have afterwards. So in that case, that ratio does mean something, which means this one will be ratio. Coming down to our third example, the number of credit hours completed per students. In this case, the credit hours are quantitative, which again means it's interval or ratio. So let's consider two examples. Somebody with 22 credit hours and somebody with 11. In the case of the person with 22 credit hours, they have twice as many credit hours completed as the first person, which means they're basically around one semester ahead. That puts them one semester closer to getting their degree done than the other student. Technically speaking, they're, they're twice as far along. That means something. And so therefore, since that ratio means something, number three is also going to be ratio. Moving on. To number four, the net income. Because it is quantitative, this means it will be interval or ratio. So let's consider 2007 and 2008 and their associated net incomes. The net income for 2008 was roughly twice as much. So what does it mean to say McDonald's net income for 2008 of roughly $4.4 billion was roughly twice as much as the roughly $2.3, $2.4 billion? Well, they might be making twice as much profit. So that could be twice as much money going towards shareholders. And again, when it comes to money, you'd rather have twice as much money and perhaps not twice as much debt. And so therefore, since that ratio also means something, number four will also be ratio. Lots of ratio happening here. We stole it all from social media. Coming down to the fifth one, this one is cross-sectional, meaning that it's going to be nominal or ordinal. You can technically order things when you only have two of them. But regardless in this case, is it necessarily better to be a full-time worker than a part-time worker? The answer is not necessarily. Because what happens if you're a part-time worker, but you have $1.5 million saved up in the stock market? 
Well, you don't have to work full time because you have so much money saved up. You're making up so much money from your dividends and the appreciation of your portfolio that it catches up the person working full time. And likewise, just because you're working full time, it doesn't necessarily mean you're worse than somebody working part time. It ultimately depends on the circumstances of the person. And so therefore, we're going to say that it is nominal. Finally, coming over to number six, the occupancy rate of the South Florida hotels. So let's consider them at their peak with the start of the pandemic and their tro in that September. In this case, we could say roughly twice as many of the rooms were filled. Well, from the perspective of the consumer, that obviously matters because now you're going to have to pay more to get a room. It'll be harder to get a room at a hotel. And from the hotel's perspective, if they have half the rooms open, they're making much less money because they still have the fixed costs of labor and the fixed costs of rent. And so therefore, no matter which perspective you consider it from, the ratio of that occupancy means something. And so therefore, this one will also be ratio. And so those constitute your examples for types of data and scales of measurement. That will be all for this lecture. The chapter 1A lecture is technically the shortest of them. And for the in-person students, for the in-person lecture, it is basically the same way. We want to start out to ensure that you have all of these foundational definitions and examples good to go. So that way when we go on to the more complicated problems and parts, you'll be ready for them. So with that said, have a great rest of your day and I'll see you with chapter 1B.